pitches between the two in which an error could occur from, from, from the human, okay? And now we say, oh, those could affect the game. Really? Could it? Or maybe the 2-1 fastball that was thrown right down the middle of the plate that the hitter looked at for strike two would have been the effect that the, the, the team needed for that a bat to change. It can't just be the robot umpire. I get it. There's error. But there's error, A, in everything, one. But two, there's human error all over the game. So now that one individual bit of human error can't be in the game anymore, but all the rest of this human error can still exist. The first base umpire, the second base umpire, the third base umpire, tossing it up to New York for video, players making errors on the field. All of that can still exist, but that human error behind home plate can't exist. That makes no sense to me. You can call in 609-807-2492. I know we have a statistics genius on the phone right now that we're going to get to right here um, so we can continue the baseball conversation on the back end of our, conversa- of our conversation with Mr. Jim Mazur. But I want to know your opinion on that. So get me on the socials, get me on the Facebook, do whatever you need to do. But I just don't believe automated umpires is the answer yet. I changed my tune, though, for a little bit of the horse racing. I have the president of Progressive Handicapper on the line, Mr. Jim Mazur. Sir, you've been on the show before, but thank you for joining me in this capacity. Hey, glad to be here, Andrew. Um, you know, your topic is awesome because uh, the one thing that we've seen this year from horse racing, for the, one of the first times we had a major controversy in the Kentucky Derby where a horse was disqualified. And it was all human, and there's no robots, and um, a lot of people weren't happy with it. So uh, it's an interesting discussion when it gets to the uh, to the robots on, uh, on these professional teams and, and the replays and all that kind of stuff. Good, good stuff. Are good you stuff. are you somebody that in the sport of horse racing feels like technology can be more pa- apparent and, and visible? Well, you know, horse racing is in the in the uh, throes of. Uh, of a technology revolution, but it's more from the, the wagering standpoint and the, um, and, and the, uh, dissemination of information. Uh, that's where most of that's been happening in horse racing. I mean, now there are computer guys that are out there, they're making algorithms and they're betting at the last minute and it really is throwing off the odds. So every, I think every sport is facing it one way or the other in, in one shape or form. So All right. good stuff. Jim Mazur, you are the president of Progressive Handicapping. Your website is proghandicap.com. Before we dive even deeper into this, can you explain to the Romo Sapiens what exactly you do at Progressive Handicapping? You know, I've been trying to figure that out for 20 years. <laughs> um, I, I, tell you, I know I take out the garbage once a day, but that, that comes with being a husband. Hey, that too. matters. You know, that's part of the job description. That matters. Um, but, uh, no, what we do is um, uh, I have developed over the last 20-plus years a, um, a business where we, we're statistic-based, and I keep track of every trainer at most of the major race meets. And every year I publish a book for those meets that is akin to, like, a baseball card for each of these trainers. Uh, let's say there's 100 trainers at uh, Monmouth Park or Belmont, and I will profile all of those hundred and give them, uh, the readers, a statistical profile so that the reader can then look at and see where the trainer is, is, has a strength or has a weakness. Now, when it comes to an event as opposed to a race meet where uh, we're talking about something like the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, the Belmont, or, or in this case, the Breeders' Cup, um, I do the same statistical analysis, but it's not necessarily based on the trainers anymore. It's based on the history of the races. And I go back and we look at 20 plus years and determine what does it take to win a particular race like the Kentucky Derby? What are the trends? What are the, um, what are the strong um, common factors among previous winners? And then we publish that in book form on the Internet and people use it. And then they incorporate it into their wagering when they go to the racetrack where they bet online or wherever they're betting. So I'm like a newsletter, like a, a stock, uh, you know, a Merrill Lynch kind of 
information um, piece that people like to have so that they can get some extra edges um, against their competition. Because, Andrew, in, in horse racing, it's not like a casino where you're playing against the house. In, in horse racing, paramutual horse racing, there's a pool of money that everybody is betting into, and that money gets dispersed out to the people who have the winning tickets after there's a takeout. Um, so if there's $100,000 bet on a certain race on, a, on, on the win pool, um, the track will take out, let's say, 20%, and then 80000 of that will be dispersed back to the winning, the winning ticket owners. So my customers are trying to be one of those people that are getting those uh, winning tickets and you are essentially their analytics team you're doing all the analytical data for them to then make the most confident best possible wager with their money when they go to these races that's exactly right yep that's exactly right we and are- we hope we get it right but um everybody knows that uh, and and most of my customers are not professional they, they might play every day but they're they're, they have another day job and they understand that what we're doing has a an element of chance and uh randomness and um they're doing it for the enjoyment of playing and hopefully like i said that they're going to have more winning days than losing days and have some meaningful caches during the year we are talking to the president of progressive handicapping that's pro g handicap.com mr jim mazer jim you say that there's randomness right to this you could run all the statistical analysis that you want you could figure out every trend every nook and cranny that could help your uh, followers gain an edge when they're putting their money down but at the end of the day right you can't always be right so my guess is over the course of time you've been more right than not and you've created a method in which has been successful for you can you talk about how you kind of handicap horses or what your method is in finding the statistics and then how you've maybe developed that method or changed it over time sure uh, i mean it depends on what we're talking about if we're talking about uh the trainers and the race meets that is all driven by um data and and uh programming that i've done over the years and we get a a feed of information in raw form, and then we we turn it into, um, you know, the finished product. Um, with the um, events like the Kentucky Derby and everything, basically I just update a database every year for the, the current winners. Uh, and it's not that difficult because there's only one Kentucky Derby winner, so I'm just adding that course on to the last 20 or so years and then lopping off some of the earlier ones so that we can keep it as uh, – as fresh as possible. Um, do I use the information myself? Of course. Um, however, I am not an everyday player, um, but I find in uh, big races like the Kentucky Derby and uh, the Breeders' Cup that it, it helps to come into the race having a certain um, statistical profile of what it takes to win the race. And l- let me give you an example. Um, there are 14 different races on the Breeders' Cup uh, weekend. There are five races for two-year-olds that will be run on Friday. And this is going to take place at Santa Anita this Friday, uh, November 1st. And then on the Saturday, the day following, there will be nine more races. And they're all in different categories. So in the um, Friday uh, races, there are races on the grass just for two-year-old guys and two-year-old girls, two different races. And you would think that they would play out the same Hmm. way, that the only difference is the the gender of the horse. But they're two different, totally different uh, histories of the race. Wow. In the juvenile uh, turf, the Europeans ship over here, and they win almost every single year. So you would think that they would have an edge uh, with the Phillies, with the the female, um, and yet they don't win. Um, The Americans win. And uh, they come out of a certain one or two races, and it's, you know, we just wait for that pattern to be broken. And we just keep going with it until, until it's a trend that it's not that way anymore, and then we look for the reason why. Wow. So, wow. So, but but go. I have gotten in front of audiences oh, yeah. <laughs> and said this. Tell me. Tell me. Here's, here's a trainer who was 0 for 65 in stakes races, and then that afternoon he wins two. Wow. <laughs> Wow. So, so it that's happens. The randomness, it is. You know, and that's where you can look bad. But 
over the long haul, like you said, we're going to be ahead betting against this guy in stakes races. Okay. Do you have a we percentage? We just happened to be there on the day that he he found the lucky the lucky coin, so to speak. Do you have a percentage on like? Do you have like a winning percentage? Like, do you keep your like your winning percentage on like what you've like said, or is that even possible? Um, you know, it's 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 virtually impossible because you're dealing with statistics for a hundred trainers in maybe 20 categories, and there's no way that we could sit around and track that every day. Right. However, however, we put out a product at various race meets, maybe about eight during the year. Um, it's called the Blue Chip Trainer Angle, and that is like saying a trainer is good in one category, and then we look at it, and then we filter out some, some of the uh, negatives in his profile, and we come up with like a super angle. Wow. And those we publish – and we do track them. And I would say the win percentage for those, just betting them on the blind, which is not what you want to do, but people will just blindly look at it. They won't even look at the horse. They'll just say, this is an angle. It's worked 30 40% in the past. We're just going to play it. Those come in about between 17 and 20% on wow. the blind. Wow. And overall, I would say your rate of return is about 20 to 25%. Yeah, wow. So yeah. to put that in perspective, if you had bet $1,000 into all of those, you would have taken home $1,250 for a $250 profit. All right. And that's 20, 25% better than putting it in the uh, the old CD at uh, 3%. So. I, I could see a lot of people taking that and, and, and loving those odds. All right, we're talking to Jim Mazur. President of Progressive Handicapping. I'll give you the website again. It's progehandicap.com. And part of the main reason why we got Jim on the show today was to talk about the Breeders' Cup this upcoming weekend. So, Jim, okay, uh, I want to. You can tell me anything you want about the Breeders' Cup. I am a novice uh, horse racing um, better, you could say. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh-huh. It is, it is right. the only sport. In the NCAA that I, or since I am an employee of the NCAA that I'm allowed to bet on because it's not an NCAA sport. So I would love <laughs> to take your advice today on the Breeders' Cup, and I'd love to put some of my bananas towards it. So we can come back next week on Monday for the Rome Show listeners and let them know how we did. Okay. So I will be in your uh, knowledge of the Breeders' Cup, writing down some notes as well, and putting some of we'll put it we'll call it the Rome Show money. We'll put some of the Rome Show money on your picks today. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so okay, so go ahead. There's fourteen, yeah. There's fourteen races, and I think the one that um, most of the um, novices or people, perhaps in your um, area, stage of the game, there that don't go. know too much about it, it's like they don't really pay any attention to anything during the year, but they will get interested in the Kentucky Derby. That's something that's commonplace. Sure. Well, the one race in the on the fourteen race menu is saved for the last race of the whole thing. And it's called the Breeders' Cup Classic. It has a $6 million purse. Wow. So that means the horse that wins is going to get 60% of that purse. So they're going to win $3.6 million. Wow. The trainer will take away 10% of that for 360000 and so will the jockey. So it is a huge, huge payday. And... The way it's structured on these big racing days is, it, uh, you know, you can bet horses just to win. You can bet them to place. But a lot of the people who are in this are looking for a bigger, bigger payoff. And there are wagers called the pick six, where you have to pick the winner of six races in a row on the Breeders' Cup card. Wow. So you wouldn't normally take one horse in each race. That would be almost impossible. That's like lotto, you know. But what you can do is you could take four horses in one race, you could take three horses in another race, oh. and you multiply it out, and that's what your, your cost of your wager is. So if you were to put in, let's say, three horses in every race um, for the pick six, let's say, it would cost you $729 to do that, which is a pretty big sum. So um, the classic is the one that's at the end. Okay. Of the rainbow. 14th to 14th. So what you're looking for in that sequence of six is to find a race where maybe you can take one horse and single it. Um, and then you maybe instead of taking three in another race, you could take five or six. Okay. So that's the way it works. So hmm. in the Breeders' Cup Classic, for the um, culmination of the 
uh, horse racing biggest race, what you will find.